Great. Um, okay, I see we're recording. Um, all right, hi, I'm Chair Lynn of the Mountain View um, Human Relations Commission. Um, I'll read this item um, in the call to order. During this declared state of emergency, this meeting will be conducted in accordance with California Government Code Section 54953, E, as authorized by resolution of the city council, please contact city.clerk at mountainview.gov to obtain a copy of the applicable resolution. All members of the Human Relations Commission will participate in the meeting by video conference with no physical meeting location. As noted on the meeting agenda, members of the public may provide oral public comments during the public comment period for an item by joining the Zoom webinar at mountainview.gov forward slash meeting. Meeting. Any emails received by 5 p.m. today were forwarded to the commission. Now I will ask the assistant to the city manager to proceed with roll call. Assistant to the city manager will now take attendance by roll call. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ball. Here I am. Commissioner Wukidu. Here. Commissioner Solomon. Here. Commissioner Webb. Present. Vice Chair Sylvester. Here. Chair Lynn. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we'll move on to minutes approval. Um, the minutes for February 3rd, 2022 meeting have been delivered to commission members and copies posted on the city hall bulletin board. If there are no corrections or additions, a motion is in order to approve these minutes. Do any of the commissioners have Anything, um, I see uh, Commissioner Solomon, I see your hand uh, raised, go ahead. Thank you, um, just a, <clears throat> excuse me, just a tiny item. Um, in the minutes, item number seven, instead of Commissioner Sylvester, it should say Vice Chair Sylvester. Thank you. Great. Okay, so um, given what Commissioner Solomon has said, um, can we make that correction and then have a motion to approve? Is that, um, assistant to the city manager, is that how, how I should? Okay. Yeah, we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes as amended. All right, I'll go ahead and make a motion. Oh, uh, Commissioner Solomon, I see your hand is raised. Oh, I was just going to offer to make a motion. Oh, okay. I second it. Um, so we'll go ahead and approve uh, the minutes with um, the correction that uh, Commissioner Solomon um, just said. And I'm, I'll need to take a roll call vote again, Chair. Okay, great. Okay. Commissioner Ball? Yep. Commissioner Wukidu? Yes. Commissioner Solomon? Yes. Commissioner Webb? Yes. Vice Chair Sylvester. Yes. Commissioner Lynn, uh, Chair Lynn. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, great. Now we'll move on to oral commun communications from the public. Um, this portion of the meeting is reserved for persons wishing to address the commission on any matter not in the agenda. Speakers are allowed to speak on any topic for up to three minutes during this section. State law prohibits the commission from acting on non-agenda items. Would any member of the public on the line like to provide comment on any non-agendized items? I see two people in the um, attendee window. So if you would go ahead and press the Zoom, or I'm sorry, the raise hand um, button, we'll be able to hear you. Yeah, and Chair Lynn, I believe the two people in the audience are connected to item 6.1. They're consultants and will be co-presenting with Michaela Hellman Tincher. Got it. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. um, they are still allowed to make comments if they'd like on any other items, but um, I don't see any hands raised. Um, so I will close this item. Um, great. And then um, if it's okay with the commissioners, um, before we move to section five, since we have um, some guests today, um, I'd like to move up the item um, 6.1, 
um, new business for the presentation of the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, and Home Investment Partnership Funding Programs. Um, if I don't see any objections, I, I guess if you have a comment on that, you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, I don't see any hands raised, so I'll go ahead and move up that item. Um, so the commission will now receive an informational update on the CDBG and Home Investment Partnership funding programs. No action will be taken on this item, item excuse me. Housing and Neighborhood Services Manager, Michaela Hellman Tincher will provide the informational update. Thank you, Chair Lynn, and good evening, commissioners. I'm going to uh, share my screen here. And um, it looks like if you could promote um, Colleen and Susan to panelists, that would be great. They'll be chiming in from time to time as needed. Whoops. Get back to the beginning of that slideshow. So again, uh, my name is Michaela Helmantinscher. I'm the new Housing and Neighborhood Services Manager here for the city, and it's my honor to meet with you all tonight. I'll just share that um, I've had an opportunity to work with the Human Rights Commission, or Human Relations Commission, in other venues before I joined the city, and I really um, am quite amazed by the amount of dedication that the commissioners put into their work into making our community. Uh, a better place and I just am thankful for the amazing volunteer time that you've put towards our community. So tonight I have the opportunity to share with you an overview of some federal grants that we received from the from HUD from the Housing and Urban Development um, Department of the federal government and um, we will be coming back to you later this year to ask for your um, thoughts on some decisions about what to do with these funds. So tonight is really just an overview to get ready for that next conversation. So the city receives um, what we call CDBG and home funds because we are um, sometimes what's known as an entitlement jurisdiction or a participating jurisdiction. So not every city in the United States receives these funds. Um, some of them are too small um, or don't have the capacity to receive the funds and receive them um, as part of a larger conglomerate of cities or jurisdictions. So it's unique um, that it's unique to our size and our capacity that we receive these funds. The funding allocations that we receive depend on the federal budget. So they go up and they go down. Um, and we also occasionally have access to additional funds when we have um, income paid back from former loans that we've made with the funds. It's a little bit hard to always uh, know exactly how many funds we'll have available in a given year. The first uh, funding uh, program that I'll share about is called the Community Development Block Grant or CDBG. This is a relatively flexible community development program established by the Department of Housing and Urban Development in 1974. Around, we get around $600,000 every year you may recall that last year we also re received some additional what they call CV, which is related to the coronavirus pandemic CDBG funds of about a million dollars. And we also used a significant amount of the program income funds that I referenced last year. So some years we have several million dollars to spend and some years um, less. The CDBG funds can be used for quite a large range of activities. It could be for acquisition of property, for the rehabilitation of residential structures, you know, other things related to construction, public facility improvements, public services like nonprofit services that you all um, have supported in the past, and even supporting businesses and economic development. The most important thing is that the CDBG funds must meet one of three national objectives. So either benefiting people with low or moderate incomes, aiding in the prevention of, or elimination of blight, or meeting some other particularly urgent need, which is a little bit of a vague term. And then there are expenditure requirements for the CDBG funds. So for example, um, and I'm having trouble seeing my whole screen here, so let me just move some something around. Here we go. Um, uh, you muted yourself. 
Thanks very much. You can only spend up to 15% of your funds on public services, um, up to 20% on administrative costs, and then you must spend at least 65% of your funds on capital projects. The other program that we'll mainly discuss tonight is HOME. This is also a HUD program, but it's really focused on housing and housing that benefits households with low incomes. It was established in 1990, and it's also an annual program. We usually get around 270 grand. This is the eligible activities are more restricted than CDBG. Um, it can be for financing um, assistance for home buyers, new homeowners. It can be for building or rehabilitating housing. It can be for um, making new developments and helping with relocation assistance. And it can be for rental assistance. And almost all of the home funds need to be used for the actual capital project. I just wanna reference that we've had access to some special funds in the past couple of years that have been allocated specifically in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Last year, we appropriated a large amount of funds from the CDBG CV CARES Act uh, bucket. And this year we will have access to something called Home ARP, which I'll be explaining. Home ARP are funds that came were allocated in the American Rescue Plan. And they're home funds in that they're meant to work on housing, but they're particularly targeted towards people who are unhoused or at risk of becoming unhoused or some other populations. And these are the qualifying populations that are listed here. We have almost a million dollars allocated to the city of Mountain View. The eligible activities are also a little different. Production or preservation of affordable housing, rental assistance. It can be used for supportive services um, which is not something that home funds typically are used for. And it could also be used for the purchase or development of non-congregate shelter, sort of like our life moves shell shelter, which is um, people have individual rooms. And for this, 85% um, of the funds must be used for the services or the housing or the shelter. Just a reminder for those of you who um, have done this before and Welcome to those of you who, like me, are new to the process. The way the city typically um, allocates these funds is in a two-year cycle for public services funds. So we typically do a notice of funding availability, nonprofits apply, and then they get granted funds for two years. So right now we're in the middle of a two-year cycle. You allocated funds last year. And then we do our capital programs for CDBG and HOME every single year. And some years we've done a NOFA process and some years we haven't. Last year, we didn't do a NOFA process um, and we allocated the funds to the Crestview Hotel project. So just to share where we're at, these are the organizations that um, you all helped us to decide to allocate funds to through the public services program last year. They're all doing their programs. We're getting good reports from them and we'll be continuing those um, for their two-year cycle. And then, what we will be considering this year is um, what to do with our CDBG capital funds, our home capital funds, and then our home ARP funds. I just wanted to flag a trend that we're hearing from the community, from our HUD partners um, about capital funds specifically. Um, I don't think it will be applicable this year, but it's something that I wanted to raise for us to discuss um, over the course of our relationship together. Um, Capital NOFAs have had, a hard, we've had a hard time having people apply to get those funds, um, specifically small nonprofits, and they usually result in relatively small renovations for a nonprofit um, with a really large administrative burden. Um, we've had numerous grant recipients share that if they had known the administrative burden that came with receiving these federal funds, they probably wouldn't have applied for them. Um, so that's just something that I'm trying to learn from and think about what to do with. And I wanted to share with the commission. I also want to share that, you know, last year, the, the HRC and the council decided to allocate all the capital funds to the Crestview Hotel project because it was a project where we knew there'd be a significant capital need and it was a priority of both the HRC and the council. Um, so it's something that we might want to consider the, learning from both of these these points um, going forward. And I think we'll probably plan on coming to you next fall to consider how we wanna handle capital funds next year um, and whether we want to do a NOFA process. 
Some things we might wanna consider are trying to align our capital funds with our affordable housing pipeline. I'll share that the city's affordable housing pipeline is starting to exceed our available funds. We have plenty of funds right now, but we have a very ambitious plan ahead. And so that's something that we are looking to find ways to leverage other resources to make sure we can build all the affordable housing that we're trying to build. Um, and then um, we may want to consider coming up with a way to carve out a capital operations program to fund the nonprofit programs that we typically fund through our NOFAs and maybe a more semi-annual way as opposed to annual perhaps, or in a different way with different, uh, with some strategic priorities that you all set. So I'm just, you know, sharing those thoughts right now. I don't have any recommendations for the commission and I, I would really love for you all to start thinking about it. And then when we come back um, and before we start thinking about our capital funds for next year, you can give us some, uh, some guidance. Here's the next steps for this year's process. Um, we will come back to you on your April 7th meeting and ask you to consider some recommendations about how to spend CDBG capital funds and home funds, as well as the home ARP funds. Then at the end of April, we'll be bringing those recommendations to council. And then in the fall, we'll come to you to talk about some of these sort of strategic questions about how we should handle next year's cycle together. And with that, I am ready for any questions. Thank you so much. Um, I see Commissioner Solomon, you have a hand raised. Yes, um, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, that was very helpful. And I, I feel as though I, even though I've been through this cycle various times, I seem to always forget from one year to the next, you know, the acronyms and what the different types of funding are. So thank you for that reorientation. I did wanna ask uh, back on slide 16, the bottom of the slide had those three options. I realize we'll talk about them further in the fall, but I didn't understand the third one uh, about considering a capital operations program for nonprofits. Could you explain what that means? Sure, and I should share. I'm just sort of throwing some ideas out there. I don't have any specific recommendations yet. I'm too new to the team. I have too much to learn from you all and um, my other city colleagues, but... Um, what I was sort of thinking about is if we were not going to do the NOFA process that we had typically done every year, would we want to come up with some sort of program where we alerted nonprofits, you know, every five years, we're going to do some sort of capital program, you know, prepare in advance, here's what all the administrative burden is, and maybe we could even conglomerate some of our money so we have a little bit more available. Um, I know some other jurisdictions do things like that. Um, but I don't know what the nonprofit community really wants or needs. So I think part of my job between now and when I come back to you in the fall is to try to learn more about, you know, the lessons learned from what they've received in the past and what they are hoping for in the future. So the, the option would be to, instead of uh, allocating funds every year to kind of save it up, and have a larger pot of money is that is that right and then hud would and hud would allow that i know that hud has all kinds of restrictions on what has to move when yeah i think that's something i need to do more research on and that's where i turn to my consultant colleagues here exactly what we can do i know you know the other question i have we have is if we want to be able to put some of the funds towards housing how we would do that. So I think it's going to require a little bit of projections on our part about how much funding we're going to receive over the next you know, five years, both from the federal government, but also from the program income, which, as I mentioned, can be considerable. I mean, that's part of why you were able to allocate so much funding last year. And so that's um, that's where we might want to do some projecting and some planning and saying, OK, we know we're going to have this much money here and we'll spend it here this much there. And we all together can come up with a more strategic Multi, perhaps a multi-year plan. But I don't, I don't actually know. This is just brainstorming with you. So if any of you have other things you'd like me to research between now and when I come back, I'm, I'm open. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Solomon. Um, I see commit, uh, Vice Chair Sylvester. Um, I saw you raise your hand. You go ahead. Thank you. I just want to say welcome, Michaela. Thank you so much um, for your great presentation. And it's really great to start working with you. I guess I have a couple logistical questions. Um, 
when will we get information about this year's applicants and how will that be delivered? And secondarily, do you have a, any sense of how many applicants we might have to review? Thank you. So um, this year we do not have any public service NOFA at all because we'll just be continuing the same public service one. And we also did not do a NOFA for um, the capital funds this year. So I think what we'll probably be considering is some of the existing projects um, that we can consider if we want to use. And if you have other direction, um, but there won't be a nonprofit applicants this year. Right. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, Commissioner Sylvester, was that, were, was that the conclusion of all your questions? Uh, your hand is still raised. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, then in that case, um, I'll call on Commissioner Webb. I see your hand is raised. Yep, I have a, it may be a silly question. Um, I'm looking at slide 13 and I'm looking at the numbers where you say you have to do an 85% minimum for this home ARP, but it says we can use up to 15% um, on administrative costs. So if there's a difference between it, so say we spend 10%, where's that 5% go? I believe that we either could not spend the funds, in which case we don't actually use them. We don't. We only draw them down, you know, when we actually get to use them, or we, um, or we would put it towards the um, the services or the shelter or whatever we decided to use the funds for. Let me just make sure I'm correct about that. Susan or Colleen, is that is that correct? Yes. Hi, this is Susan Walsh. Yes, that's correct. So, in other words, the maximum. For home ARP for administration is 15%, but if you chose to use 10%, then 90% of the funds could use to the project housing or services costs. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, I see Commissioner Solomon, you have your hand raised. Yes, um, I just wanted to follow on to um, Commissioner Sylvester's question. Um, so commonly, when this time of year comes around, we get a huge binder of materials to review. And it sounds as though, since there weren't NOFAs this year, we probably won't have a huge binder of materials to review. But I just wanted to ask if we will be expecting uh, some sort of binder of materials to review in advance, uh, just just to know so that um, we can, uh, you know, mark time on our calendars, like set aside time to perform the review, um, because at least in the past, it has sometimes been quite uh, an extensive review process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is good feedback that I didn't have before, so that's good to know. Um, no, I don't expect it to be significant in terms of time that you'll need. That being said, we will be providing a staff report in advance with um, staff recommendations and questions for the commission. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? Um, I have my hand raised, but I wanna make sure everyone else gets. Uh, okay, in that case, I'll, um, I'll go ahead and ask my question sort of, oh, does, oh, sorry, um, Commissioner Ball, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just want to clarify on that last one. So is, is that to understand we will not be expecting detailed information about the applicants? We are only expecting kind of a high level staff report and recommendations? Thanks. Yes. So we did not have a NOFA process this year. So it will we will not have applicants to consider. We will have uh, spending opportunities to consider that I, um, I we're still doing our internal staff work to determine exactly what, we'll, what we will be bringing forward. But I, I expect there will be some decisions to be made and oops, um, and some uh, some questions to answer, but it will not be applicants as you typically do with the NOFA process. Hey, Commissioner Ball, is that the conclusion of your questions? Yes, thank you. Um, in that case, I'll go ahead and ask my questions. Sort of, this is a very popular question. I'm glad uh, we got it started. Um, I was wondering, um, for, are we allowed to request those materials to be delivered to us paperless? Um, I don't know if, Michaela, if that's a question for you or if that's 
more of a question for Christina. I'll defer to Christina Gilmore. So what, what I'm hearing is that for this year's uh, meeting, the public hearing in April, that there will be a staff report with detailed recommendations and supporting information in the staff report with questions for the commission to consider that the commission most likely will not be receiving applicant information like you have in the past. So the staff report would come electronically um, and, uh, you know, but for future years, when we have more of the public services, we certainly can make an effort to deliver those materials uh, um, electronically. And then if there are requests for paper copies, if people have you know, a request for that, we can make that um, adjustment as needed. Yeah, I would. Um, I always appreciate the effort that goes into printing out those large binders when we have um, those NOFA years. Um, that we need to consider, but I, um, I don't know, I'm used to going paperless now and if any other commissioners um, are interested in that, um, I know I would be. Um, I see um, Colleen has her hand raised. Go ahead. Hi, good evening, everyone. I just wanted to um, add just a little point of clarification that while you won't be seeing like a NOFA, NOFA applicants, you will be seeing the city's annual action plan, which will kind of provide an overall view of how those CDBG and home dollars will be spent in the 2022-2023 fiscal year. So you will, and it is a continuation, like Michaela said, of what's the city is currently funding this year, but so you will have, you know, that opportunity to kind of remind yourself and review how those funds are being used and, you know, what those agencies are doing and whatnot. So you will have all that information. Um, just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Um, and then I had another question, um, Michaela and Colleen and Susan, if um, uh, in the feedback that you said you got from applicants, um, you said something about a high administrative um, burden on them. And I'm curious um, where that administrative burden came from. Is that um, sort of something that the city could control or is that, uh, sort of strings attached to the the federal application. Um, yes, Colleen. Um, so, and I, I, I'm, I'm Michaela. Please feel free to interrupt me if you want. But I know Michaela's new, so she probably hasn't gotten quite as much feedback. Uh, but um, you know, the real issue is just the the HUD regulations around the use of CDBG and home funds, environmental review requirements, um, just documentation. It, it is a very, you know, it's a, it's a federal program. It's very extensive what's required. And a lot of nonprofits don't have, you know, the staff capability to manage um, all of those various requirements. And I think that's kind of the feedback that the city has gotten is, you know, oh, you know, we thought we were just getting um, you know, this pot of money to do this repair work in our community room, we didn't understand that we had to do all of these things. So I think it's, I think it's two pieces, right? And I think city staff has had those internal conversations about being very clear from the beginning of the process, what it means to get CDBG and home funds, because I, I do think that piece was missing in previous years, but also just, you know, it, it's a federal program. It's pretty extensive what's required. Um, I hope that answers your question. That's two pieces. It really is. It really is HUD's fault. No, just kidding. <laughs> but it's also just, you know, it, it's, it's an administrative burden. And I do think moving forward, you know, with the city staff, it's been discussed on how to make sure that these nonprofits that are applying to this money, if they've never managed a capital project with federal funds, all that that entails, because it, it is, it is very extensive. Yeah, thank you for that insight. Um, and then just to add, not really a question, but a comment, and maybe we can hear updates later, but Michaela, I do appreciate um, sort of your um, efforts to sort of go into the community and sort of figure out how we can get more exposure um, for these grants, um, just because I, I have heard from us, like nonprofits in the community that they, they don't even know that these funds are available or um, they've never heard of them or, or something like that. And um, I think um, 
that would be great to um, have uh, more of um, more folks like really understand what this is and have more transparency into the processes and everything. So um, really glad to have you on board um, to to be able to do that good work. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the commissioners? Um, in that case, I think staff, do I um, close this item at this point? Um, I know- yes, There's no action to be taken. It's okay. just an informational okay. report. So um, just to recap, you know, the April, the April meeting, regular meeting will be the public hearing. And um, we will work on getting that staff report out with the agenda packet. Um, and I will coordinate with Michaela to see if we can get out a few days earlier than the regular posting so that you have a, a few extra days um, in your in your week um, to review the materials and be prepared for the public hearing. Great, that's much appreciated. Thank you for all that work. And um, just wanna mention, I did skip public comment because we don't have any attendees um, from the public. Um, just having that on the record. Um, and in that case, if no one else has anything to add, I'll go ahead and close out this item and go back um, in the agenda to um, item. Oh yeah, thank you so much, Michaela and um, Colleen and Susan for joining. That was very helpful. And we look forward to um, working with you further in the coming months. Um, Great, and um, should I move or, oh, they'll exit on their own, okay. Um, great, so um, we'll move on to section five, unfinished business. Um, so we'll hear now from the subcommittees and hear about their work. Um, section 5.1, the color of law subcommittee. Um, the color of law subcommittee will now present an oral update. No action will be taken on this item. Um, Vice Chair Sylvester um, and Commissioner Solomon and Commissioner Webb, um, would one or all of you like to provide the oral update? I think as always, I will volunteer Vice Chair Sylvester. I volunteer oh, as tribute. I, I'm, I'm, it's a voluntelling as, as some colleagues of mine call it. <laughs> to yes. start. I think I volunteered Commissioner yes. Solomon. Commissioner Webb. Oh my God, I'm gonna, I, I take notes, I'm keeping receipts. Um, <laughs> I'm just gonna make something ridiculous up just so you could both be horrified about what, what I came up with. Um, <laughs> Thank you for having a sense of humor about that, but I'm actually thinking of, of doing that, but I, I don't have enough sense of humor right now to, to come up with something funny and horrible. Um, I, I, as always, I forget where we left, last, last left off last month because we are very actively working in between meetings. So I always forget what I've told you versus what we've already done. Uh, so forgive any redundancy. Um, let's see. Um, we're a complicated project. There is a team of us that has been focused on um, building up a collection of newspaper ads, articles, editorials, and, and similar um, from the 1920s to a, about the 1960s. So there are three of us. Uh, I'm the only one on the, this uh, this part of the project working that that are go that uh, are actually going into the library and looking for stories that suggest trends in housing discrimination. Um, against different kinds of biasing it, about housing, about renters um, and similar. So we're building up a little bit of an archive. Um, the management of those materials is of, in itself an interesting sub part of this project. We have a Google Drive and we're collecting, collecting, collecting. We're also collecting materials from other sources, um, just articles about housing, more modern articles, different kinds of artifacts. Um, as a matter of fact, we hope to add to that set of artifacts, I, I got the date wrong earlier this week, I think in about two weeks, uh, some of us, uh, including uh, Professor Khan from Stanford, will be going down to Santa Clara 
um, to actually go through their archives to look for deeds that might have deed restrictions in them. So wish us luck. We <laughs> They only allow groups to come in, small groups to come in once a month. Um, and the scheduling is one or two months out from when you will get an appointment. So we're hoping we find something interesting and don't have to go back and try to schedule again. <laughs> uh, but wish us luck. I'm hoping we find some very interesting things and hopefully these archives are relatively accessible, but none of us know what we're getting into. Um, let's see. We are also working on with Mountain View Historical Association um, on what I'm calling part one of oral histories. We have some um, longtime Mountain View residents and longtime historical association members digging through some oral history archives looking for stories that reference housing discrimination or lack thereof in the city of Mountain View. Um, they know their stories in there, but people are manually combing through transcripts. Uh, those folks are also going to be giving us names of people they think we can go talk to um, or talk to their children um, and do some follow-up storytelling. The stories they're looking through are typically from the 1970s, so they are useful, but there could definitely be some follow-up. Um, we're also working with various partners. I think I'll save an update for next month on that. Uh, but lastly, and now to the meat of it, which I might turn over to Commissioner Solomon because it's fair. Uh, we have been working on a survey, um, survey similar to what we did for our online policing work, where we had people tell us stories, kind of abstractly, just tell us stories about um, what you've faced in terms of housing discrimination in our community. It's, I think, Two, two major question type survey, very open-ended. Um, we have been working diligently and very uh, <laughs> consistently with Christina and thank you, Christina, for all your help. Um, we have an almost final version of that, um, hopefully final review on Monday. It will get translated and then we will be sharing that about um, around the community via various partners, organizations and the city's help too, um, to hear people's stories that they have, can tell from anywhere you know, as far back as they can go up to current times. Uh, so we look forward to seeing what comes of that. Commissioner Solomon, would you like to add anything to the survey discussion or would either of the commissioners or Christina like to chime in on the project um, in general? Um, I'll just add that, um, so there is an option for uh, folks to upload. Uh, we hope that it will work out this way within the programming. Uh, of the survey for folks to upload if they happen to have a document that provides an example of uh, discriminatory language. So that would be um, assuming that that will be possible within the survey platform. It would be really interesting to get uh, some of those documents to be able to uh, include that in the review um, and sharing of materials. So I think, I think too, I, the other comment I would add is that when, when it comes time to disseminate information about that survey, um, I think that um, we would, we as a subcommittee would love to have the whole HRC's help to spread the word um, to diverse uh, communities and individuals uh, within Mountain View and anyone that you may know who perhaps lived in Mountain View decades ago, who may have had a relevant experience, who might be interested to share a story and or a document. And, and we're also looking at second person heard of types of comments as well. I know we had a discussion about that because uh, we may not have people that lived here that far long ago but their kids may have lived there and they may have some experience, but it will be secondhand. And that still helps to contribute to the, the discussion. Thank you both for uh, a, a little bit more information. And um, Christina, I guess we will work with you to figure out how to get this, um, the survey, whatever the tool is. And sorry, we've gone through a lot of iterations as to what that tool should look like. Mm -hmm. Um, and what it should be. Um, uh, if we can distribute that, whatever that link is to everybody, that would be great. So we don't violate any Brown Act. If you could do that, that would be wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, we just don't know what we're going to see. So um, hopefully it will be, it will be powerful and very interesting and hopefully have a nice wide reach. So thank you all.
Thank you, um, subcommittee members. Um, I know it's a huge task. Sounds like there's lots of different, um, almost like sub sub committee work that is going yes. on, like many parts to this. So, and I know you mentioned a, a Google Drive that um, I guess um, we can start on commission questions. Um, I was, if anyone has any. Um, I'll start with my own. I have several. Um, I guess one is, um, this is all amazing work. Um, and I know that you meant there was mention of a Google Drive where you're housing all of this great information. And I'm curious, um, I, I think this subcommittee had started out as the a civility roundtable type um, subcommittee. I Someone can uh, correct me on that if I'm wrong, but I'm curious as to, um, what the end product or how we will share this um, at its conclusion, what the end product might be um, for the, the community at large. Um, I'm happy to take that. We are, are, I don't know if we're calling it a CRT, I think there's been much discussion about what that even means in the uh, current HRC. Um, but we are having an event, um, I believe, May 19th, correct me if I'm wrong, Christine, I don't have my calendar, it's on the other computer sitting next to me. Um, so May 19th, we're having an hopefully, knock on wood, looking good, in-person event um, that will have three parts. One will be a, somebody kind of overviewing some of the materials and why we studied this and some of our findings. The second part, hopefully, will be the ability for people to, pre, sort of pre-selected people to share some of their stories directly with the audience. Uh, about discrimination or lack thereof that they've seen in housing. So telling their own life story in person and then wrapping it up HRC style with some community dialogue among um, tables. And we're actually hoping that all of us could help moderate. Um, we're definitely looking for moderators. This is not gonna be complex questions. It'd be just sort of leading the conversation and helping keep it on track and wrap it up. Uh, so that is still the output. But the research is needed for uh, part one of the event. We're also still hoping to, especially since it looks like it can be in person, have a, if you will, a physical, literal physical timeline around a wall so people can look at some of these, um, these artifacts that we're generating, like stories and deeds and whatever. This sounds really great. A very impressive effort. Um, are there any other questions from the commission? I don't actually have a question, but I just um, looking forward to what you're going to dig up. It looks like going on a treasure hunt at the same time, you know, <laughs> trying to dig out a needle in a, in a uh, you know, in a haystack and uh, it's all going to be interesting. I just want to look forward to that and see what you, you dig up. It's, I think it's very interesting, but it seems very tedious at the same time, but it looks like an amazing thing at the end of it also. All the best. Thank you. Um, you know, it, the needle on the haystack is somewhat appropriate because Mountain View was a very, very diverse and supportive community in general. So there, the needles in the haystack, we know that there are deeds with restrictive covenants in them. I mean, we know, and we've read a, editorials that sort of randomly pop up in what was, what became the Mountain View voice that are definitely pretty horrible, but they are a little bit harder to find and that is probably a, that's a good thing but um i i don't know if it's really that frustrating as work goes it's not that tedious um unless we're digging through old stinky newspapers in the library which is tedious <laughs> but thank you <laughs> we appreciate your support and your empathy are there any more um questions or comments from the Commissioners? Um, if not, I'll move to the next item. Um, I don't see any members of the public, so we'll skip public comment. Um, Section 5.2, the Racial Reconciliation Subcommittee um, will now present an oral update. Um, no action will be taken on this item. Commissioners Ball, Nwakidu, and Webb, um, would you like to provide an oral update? I'm going to volunteer, Professor or Commissioner Nokito. 
Nirvana, can you give us our update? You are I, our fearless I leader. You, I spoke the first, the last time, <laughs> but okay, well, that's fine. Um, after our last meeting, um, we met again. And we were just, we just focused mainly on trying to come up with the naming, um, which we're still working on. It's not conclusive, uh, but also Christina presented to us that she um, had gotten a proposal from PCRC, and but she still had them uh, working on doing some corrections there. And um, I think that was mainly what that was because I think we had a very short time to to you know because Christina had to live on some other engagement. And we just put to the date for our next meeting, which was supposed to happen on the 28th, but we're going to have it on Monday the, the, the 7th. Um, but during that time, I also mentioned that I had reached out to Candidly Speaking, and Christina and I met with um, Nicole, and it was a great meeting. Um, and I appreciated Christina for being there. And I was able to really give um, a very clear explanation of you know, our idea or what we're hoping for and some of the outcomes. And um, so that was very, very helpful to have Christina with me um, for that meeting. But it went further where it now included Adolfa, who actually is the founder of Candidly Speaking. So we had a follow-up meeting, which was also quite um, interesting. It was also very brief because I had an engagement to go to. And so they presented us with a proposal, which um, Christina is um, you know, going to kind of make it a little more simpler and maybe distribute it. So that's just generally it. Christina, do you have anything to add to that since you were there with me? No. So yeah, so the subcommittee will meet on Monday and we'll, they'll have an opportunity to review the two proposals for the facilitators and um, hopefully make a decision on um, which facilitator they like to move forward with, but it's um, good, good, good news that we have two um, parties who are very interested and excited about this um, subcommittee's ideas, and so I think it's going to be, um, a, it's going to turn out to be a great event. We don't have a date yet, so that that will be another agenda item <laughs> to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, thinking of uh, some dates to uh, hold this event. Did I leave anything out? Um, Commissioner Ball and Webb. And then we had brief meetings uh, all the time. So I, I mean, have that was a quick one. And I just know that you guys were jumping on the other one. Um, so our, our meeting what, was like, it was less than 30 minutes, right? Yeah, it was really quick. But yeah, it was nothing else in addition to what we talked about the previous. Looks like that's it for us. Great. Um, then we'll move on to commissioner um, comments and questions. I see Commissioner Solomon, you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you. Um, I just had a, I, I'm very excited about this event, especially from what was presented in the last meeting, um, you know, where uh, I really started to develop like a, a mental picture of, of what the event could be like. And that was very exciting. Um, I had a question about, so there are two proposals uh, from organizations to potentially facilitate. And so is does the city have funds to pay the facilitators? Is that they've made proposals, there's some kind of RFP process request for proposals, they've responded. So it, it, am I understanding that correctly? You are correct, yes. Great, okay. Great. And is that, and I'm assuming that that goes beyond our very small annual HRC budget. In other words, there's funding from somewhere else that's available. Correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Um, Vice Chair Sylvester, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. I do. Um, I have a somewhat similar question. Um, so it would be either PCRC or um, Candidly Speaking doing the moderation, or would there be a role for both of them? I know that you were very, very interested in the candidly speaking folks before, but there were a lot of questions about them. So I'm just curious how that's shaking out. Yeah, I think the assumption is that we would pick one facilitator. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, I'll, I have a question. So sort of on that facilitator um, uh, line of questioning, do, 
does is there still a requirement or us a, a need for the other commissioners to co like sort of contribute as like breakout room facilitators? Is that still the understanding? Um, so I think that's still something that hasn't been determined yet. So um, the subcommittee can certainly um, share out at the next meeting, um, you know, what once they have determined which facilitator they like to move forward with and their model, then they can report out on how the event will unfold and if there are any additional needs for commissioners to participate in that event, other than being an attendee. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we unfortunately were not able to meet as much since our last meeting as we had hoped for, so we don't have as big of an update this time around, but we're meeting on Monday. It's okay, February was a short month, so totally understandable. Are there any other questions or comments from the commissioners? Okay, if I don't see any hands raised and I also don't see anyone in the public um, attendee room, so um, I'll go ahead and move on to um, Section 5.3, the Bystander Training Subcommittee, um, which will now present an oral update. No action will be taken on this item. Uh, me and, well, uh, Chair Sil uh, Vice Chair Sylvester and I um, will now provide an oral update. So um, I know Vice Chair, you've uh, done a lot of the updates, I think for your last subcommittee. So, um, if you're okay with it, I'm happy to um, give a really brief update. Um, Please so, do. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, sorry? Please do. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm um, happy to. So um, we had a meeting um, really quick with staff, um, Christina, and um, so we were trying to discuss next steps of what we wanted to do with um, the information that we had um, gathered about, you know, who among local folks might be interested in um, bystander training in holding one and also um, who we might also engage to facilitate a training. Um, we decided that, um, due to um, sort of staff constraints and um, limitations on resources for this fiscal year. Um, we'll go ahead and um, do some of the, maybe the, um, the prep work, um, like gathering more details on um, those uh, groups that can help us facilitate and maybe um, figure out more um, community partners that we could, um, uh, that we can work with um, to hold a bystander training for next fiscal year. Um, so we're thinking that this is something that can move on to um, next year's work plan. Is that, um, do you have anything to add, um, Vice, Chair, Vice Chair Sylvester or, um, mm -hmm. yes, go ahead. I think that pretty much says it all. I think the idea would be um, in the new fiscal year to have it relatively new in the in the fiscal year since we're doing some of the groundwork now, but that's about it. And just a reminder, I um, do have the action item to follow up with Joe Smidian's office to see what his availability and timing and what his support could look like. Okay, and then um, does staff have, any, have anything to add to that? Hopefully I captured that accurately. Yeah, no, and nothing to add. I think you captured it accurately. I think also the subcommittee was tasked to, you know, identifying if there are other entities that are holding bystander trainings that would be available to Mountain View residents. And if there are, then helping to promote that. So I think that's still not an ongoing action and that the subcommittee can, you know, work if, if you come across um, any other trainings in the area that community members might want to participate in. Great, thank you. And um, I know that, um, it, oh, oh, sorry. Um, I was going to add something, but it slipped my mind. So um, we'll go, go ahead and move on to um, any questions from the commission or comments. Okay, um, I don't see any. Um, oh, I know what I was going to add, just that, um, 
in hopes that next year um, we'll be able to have the bystander training in person, um, just because a, a lot of this training requires um, like role playing or things that um, probably are better communicated in person. So um, with that hope, I think um, it's something for next year to look forward to. Um, great, and then no one is in the attendee box, so I will skip uh, public comment for this um, and go on to um, section seven, commission and staff comments, questions, and any commission reports. Um, no action. Here. Sorry, I sorry, oh, sorry. I apologize. It may not have been in your script, but we do have one more subcommittee update, the Multicultural Festival Subcommittee, oh. which Commissioner Webb is the liaison to that. Sorry, um, so sorry to miss that. Um, yeah, I didn't um, see it in the chair notes, but um, would love to get a um, an update from Commissioner Webb on that. Well, um, this is the first time I attended the, the, the meeting and the deadline is here. It, it's starting on, it's um, the 26th of March. Um, it looks like everything is falling into place. The, the city staff has done an excellent job um, of pulling this together. Seems like they're old hats at it now. Um, um, the logistics, uh, they've taken into consideration everything as far as COVID is concerned, the spacing, um, 